Hey everybody, welcome to another Chem Complete episode. And in our lesson today, I want to take an in-depth view of the hybridization of carbon. So this is one of the first lessons that you will usually come across when you start learning organic chemistry. And you may talk about hybridization in a regular general chemistry class, but is one of two bonding theories that we can utilize to help explain how bonding is going to occur. So this is going to be in the context of organic chemistry and carbon, but you can really talk about hybridization theory outside of just carbon. But we are going to focus on that for today with carbon specifically and organic chemistry. So that's coming up right now. All right, so as always, before I get started here, remember to head on over to Chem Complete if you need guides of any sort for assistance, such as a guide on how to successfully pass organic chemistry. We have one of those. So go check it out at the website. If you could leave a like if the content is helpful, that's much appreciated. Now let's go ahead and get started. So what do I want to talk about here? This is going to be a multi-part series. We're going to go through SP3 and some of the background of hybridization in this particular lecture. And then we will have other ones that address sp2 and sp hybridization because you're starting to talk about pi electrons double bonds triple bonds and then we may even tie it in with resonance at the end but to start with i want to go over these four major points in this lecture right here the first one is i want to do a general chemistry a real quick review of carbon and just make sure that everybody is on the same page before we start approaching the hybridization of carbon we want to know what carbon looks like sort of in isolation without bonding where are the electrons located how many protons does it have etc okay then we're going to take a look at methane before we introduce hybridization and that is a very good example because if we look at methane sort of before we start discussing the hybridization theory it really leads into why hybridization most likely is a thing okay and the reason behind hybridization why does it occur we'll address that at the end because there are very practical reasons not just for carbon but for all atoms to undergo hybridization when possible during bonding and then we will obviously take a detailed look at hybridization for carbon becoming sp3 hybridized and what does that mean so if you don't understand what sp3 means right now that's no problem we're going to address that all right so let's start off with our basic review of carbon so if you've come out of a general uh, i would say middle school certainly a high school chemistry class you should have an understanding of the periodic table and you should have an understanding of elements and one of those elements is carbon and we know that carbon, which is represented with a C on the periodic table for its symbol, has six protons. And don't forget that protons are how chemicals actually, or elements, derive their identity, is the number of protons, right? So the fact that this atom here has six protons is what makes it carbon. If it had seven protons, it would be a nitrogen and so on. Depending on the protons you have, you would look at the atomic number associated with a given element on the periodic table okay now the most common carbon is going to have six neutrons and that's what we refer to as carbon 12 there are varying numbers and degrees of neutrons that are out there for carbon and we would call those a group of isotopes but carbon 12 12 referring to the total mass six from protons six from neutrons is about 99 percent of the carbon that we have in the known universe roughly okay and then finally we have six electrons the electrons are going to become important here because electrons are what we use in order to create bonds and electrons are going to be at play when we talk about hybridization theory All right now one of the other things i want to mention with carbon is the electron configuration and an orbital diagram so the electron configuration for carbon is going to be 1s2 2s2 2p2 so keep in mind when we start going through electron configuration, we start at the lowest quantum level, which would be n equals 1. That takes us through hydrogen and helium, and then we go to n equals 2, and we climb from there. So when we get to n equals 2, the second level has two different types of orbitals. It has an s orbital, and it also has a p orbital, and we refer to them with the quantum number in front of that given orbital so we would say a 2s orbital and a 2p orbital and then we would open up the 3s after that so carbon exists in that second row 
of the periodic table and we go four electrons deep. We fill up the s orbital with the first two and then we fill up the p orbital. Uh, I should say p orbitals because there's really three of them. There is px, py, and pz and that's because the p orbital has some three-dimensionality to it and some directionality to it because it's sort of this uh, dumbbell or figure eight figure, uh, if you will, okay? And that one's really supposed to be coming kind of like out of the plane. So you could talk about an X, a Y, and a Z. So those are the three P orbitals that exist, and they exist at every quantum level. So you've got 2P, 3P, 4P, all the way down, but you don't have it at one, okay? That's the only one that doesn't have it, so there's only such thing as a one S orbital, no one P. All right, so if we look at carbon, and we look at its orbital diagram, we know that if we rank the orbital diagram, and some people do this uh, vertically, some people do it horizontally, we can label this as energy, right? So increasing energy as we go up. And what we would say is down here, here's our nucleus. And then we've got the 1s orbital. And we can fill that with two electrons, both that have a opposite spin of one another. And then we go to 2s, we can fill that with two electrons and then when we go to 2p we have px py and pz so we've got all three of them and there's only two more electrons left in this particular uh, valence shell and so I fill one per p orbital and that's Hun's rule I would have to fill all of them in order to start pairing right so we don't pair these together until there's one in each of the equal energy levels there and that is the orbital diagram for a carbon and what the electron distribution kind of looks like there. Okay, so following all the rules and the energy, we put the electrons closest to the nucleus first with 1s because that's stabilizing, and then we build from there. So 2s is more stable than 2p, and then 2p would be more stable than 3s, and it climbs. So what I want to take a look at now, if we understand that, is going to be methane so we're going to draw CH4 and we're going to talk about it for a minute and compare it relative to this orbital diagram. Okay, so methane is going to be CH4. And I'm not going to worry too much with the wedges and dashes in the stereochemistry here, but I will try to draw a relatively tetrahedral structure. Okay, so here's methane. Now, if you consider that when these hydrogens that have a single electron come to the table to bond with a carbon, okay, they are going to be bonding with the valence electrons that the carbon has. And valence electrons refer to those outer shell electrons. So what I highlight right here, these will be the electrons that are available for bonding with any of these hydrogens that are coming in to form methane. Now, what's interesting here is that if you were to go look at the nucleus, okay, of a carbon, the s orbital is going to have a different approximation or closeness to the nucleus than a p orbital would. And what that means is that because we find two of the electrons related to the s and two that are up in the p, I would not expect the bond lengths and the energies of these bonds to be equivalent all the way around and that could start affecting the tetrahedral structure so that is to say that because 2p is more elongated or further away from the nucleus i would expect that two of these bonds at a minimum would have a different type of spacing and length in comparison to the other two involved with the s orbital but that's not what we have found studies of methane have shown that these are equivalent so they're equivalent in length and energy and each one of them is going to be equal okay in that spacing and in that setup in that bond length and what that means is that this current model does not seem to work as it stands alone and this is where we get the idea or the theory of hybridization occurring during bonding so this works well to explain carbon in isolation but once carbon is going to get involved with bonding partners, the resulting geometry and bond lengths that we can study show us that these are all equivalent. They're not occurring in the S and the P. They seem to be occurring in some sort of orbital that is equivalent across the board for the entire valence shell. 
and that is where we get hybridization. So I'm going to redraw the orbital diagram now and I'm going to reference what is occurring with hybridization. So what we're going to primarily focus on here is the valence electrons and that's because those are the ones that are valid for bonding. We don't consider the 1s electrons for bonding situations with carbon. So here's 2s and higher in energy than that is 2p and I'm going to put that up here and we have our two electrons here. So there's a total of four valence electrons that the carbon has for bonding and if I go back up to the methane hydrogen will always bring one electron and the carbon must bring one electron for this covalent bond or this shared bond that we have. And so if that's going to happen carbon needs all four of these electrons to hand out one apiece to each hydrogen. So when we get ready to hybridize here for methane, the hybridization process is just as we would talk about hybrids in the regular English language. It's a blend or a mixture or of at least two or more things. Now, in the case of carbon, if we're going to make hybrid orbitals, we have S orbitals and we have P orbitals. So you can almost imagine that there's some sort of an imaginary orbital blender that we're going to put these into. And we're going to mix them up, shake them, blend them, and we're going to pour out our new hybrid orbitals that are perfectly mixed together. These orbitals are going to be in between the energy of S and P because if S is lower in energy and it's blending with P which is higher in energy the result is going to be something that is in between those two factors and so these are what we call our SP orbitals these are the hybrid orbitals that result and this process occurs when the carbon is getting ready to bond hybridization of the orbitals is thought to occur okay now when we have this, these new orbitals that come out here need to have electrons for bonding. And so the electrons that went into the hybridization process come out of the hybridization process. And there are a total of four electrons here, two of them in the 2s, and there's two of them in the 2p. So we're going to evenly distribute them, still following Hund's rule, one electron per hybrid orbital. And this is exactly where you get the four unpaired electrons when you draw the Lewis dot structure for carbon that are ready for bonding with a partner such as a hydrogen. These lone electrons here that are bonding and are no longer lone when they get involved in a covalent bond are these hybridized orbitals with electrons waiting for these bonding partners to come in. Now when you see this where do because we're talking about sp3 that's the title here what are we talking about with sp3 well the three is referring to the number of p orbitals that were brought into the hybridization process so in this process there was an s orbital brought in and there were three p orbitals that were brought into the process px py and pz if i'm hybridizing all of them so the result is that i get an sp3 hybridized carbon that has four electrons ready for bonding with bonding partners okay so that three a lot of students confuse is it the number of electrons well no there's four electrons there the three has to do with the number of p orbitals that came into the process of hybridization and the number of orbitals that go in are the number of orbitals that come out of the hybridization process the number of electrons that go in are the number of electrons that are coming out so because s and then three of the different 2p orbitals went into this hybridization process to make a total of four orbitals, 2s, 2px, 2py, and 2pz. We get four hybrid orbitals. They come out all equivalent in energy and all ready for a bonding partner. And so the carbon that just underwent this process would be referred to as being sp3 hybridized. And that is hybridization. Now, one of the last questions we want to address is why does this occur? Why does hybridization occur? And there's really two good reasons that hybridization occurs. The first reason, okay, is to attempt to equalize the energy levels between the bonding orbitals. So if you look at the diagram, you can see that S and P are not at the same energy levels. And what we said was when the resulting methane comes out, we are looking at equal distance and equal energy 
with all of those bonds. And so to equalize the energy levels is of great help during this process. And the second one that's equally important is that it's going to provide a better orbital overlap. So it provides better orbital overlap. Okay, And this is important because you have to consider the shape of S and P orbitals. And when you consider the shape, they are not going to be in alignment with one another very well. And when you hybridize, you will get a better alignment. So that is to say, if I take a look at a an S orbital, okay, and a P orbital, and they are trying to come together, so let's say that this is the hydrogen, and it's got an electron in an S proximity, and then the P has some electron up here. Now this is two-dimensional and it's a little far out there in terms of the reality of the situation, but this is not a good alignment for the electrons to be shared together. You want good orbital overlap when you're trying to share electrons. And so by hybridizing them, we kind of get these sp3 orbitals that look more like a teardrop, okay, around the carbon. And if all of them are going to be hybridized, then you're going to see that in all of the positions. So here are the four hybrid orbitals. Okay, it's not a circle around the carbon. It's also not a p orbital, even though if you took the top of the bottom here, it might look like this. These are all sp3 orbitals. And then the hydrogen could come in and get much better overlap right here. Or if another carbon approaches for a carbon-carbon single bond, you get much better overlap. Okay, so equalizing the energy levels and providing better orbital overlap are keys as to what is driving this. Why is this happening? Okay, so that's going to wrap up the introduction to hybridization of carbon and the sp3 hybrid. So in the next lecture or the second part of this series, we're going to take a look at pi bonds versus sigma bonds and differentiate that. And then once we have an understanding of that, we're going to head into talking about sp2 hybridization. So in an sp2 hybrid, only two p orbitals are brought in and one is left behind. And we're going to want to know why it's left behind and what its purpose is or what it's being used for. So... Please remember again to like the video if it helped. If you comment, I'll try to interact with you and answer any questions. Chemcomplete.com, head on over there, pick up a guide to help support the channel. It's much appreciated. And as always, just subscribing and staying tuned with the latest content is appreciation enough. You guys are great. Thank you for learning with me. And I'll see you all next time for the second lecture.